Hi, everybody, and welcome to our uh, webcast today on how software enables the industrialization of additive manufacturing. Uh, we've got a, a great panel pulled together today. I'm excited to learn more about this. Uh, we're going to give people just a few more minutes to join, and then uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our panel. Thank you for joining. A couple of uh, housekeeping things while we're uh, while we're here and waiting to get started. Um, during the uh, during the broadcast today, um, all of the participants will be in just a listen only mode. Um, but we are excited to capture your questions. We'll try and get to as many of them as we can today. Um, any that we don't get to, we'll try and follow up with you after the event. Um, but you can uh, you should see a questions tab in your uh, GoToWebinar. Um, that allows you to put questions in. Um, if you have a, any questions that uh, are about um, technical problems or something, we'll try and answer those real time. Um, but then any questions about the, uh, the topic, we'll try to make sure that we get to um, after the planned questions. And then again, if we don't get to them, we'll try to follow up with you to make sure that uh, we can get you some answers on those. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're a couple of minutes after the hour and I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. Um, again, welcome to uh, this uh, AMC Bridge webinar, um, how software enables the industrialization of additive manufacturing. Uh, my name's Jim Brown, I'm the president of Tech Clarity and I'll be our host today. I'm really excited to, uh, to learn from this, uh, this group and this panel. Um, we've got a great group uh, planned for you. We've got uh, Igor Sinman from uh, AMC Bridge, uh, we've got uh, Egil Katzen from, uh, from uh, GE Additive and uh, Maritz Meyer from Elise. And uh, very excited to hear what they all have to say about additive manufacturing, but also um, you know, some of the challenges, but also the, the ways we can get by those uh, challenges with the sort of intricate connection between software and additive. So, Let's go ahead and get started with our first question. And I'm going to ask a question to all of all of the audience uh, or all of the participants. Um, and we'll start with Igor. And uh, Igor, if you can just give us a little bit about your experience with additive manufacturing, um, but also what's what are some of the new and exciting um, and, and interesting things happening with additive as we move towards the uh, you know sort of industrial maturity? I, I'm not hearing you, Gore. I don't know if anybody else is. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> well, you know, yeah, you yeah. know we uh, always want to start off on a light note uh, and, and not take these things uh, too seriously. So this is perfect. If, <laughs> technical, if you well, again. I'm glad to be uh, fleeing the technical issues first. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I just want to say that uh, uh, additive manufacturing has a particular interest to me. I was trained as a physicist, as physicist back in the, in the days and then switched to software development. And additive manufacturing is such an interesting kind of combination of uh, advanced physics and material science. And I was actually trained in material science and the software that I'm doing for the last uh, 30 years of my life. Uh, and in particular, plus 20 plus years, uh, we at AMC Bridge and I in particular was involved in engineering software. So additive manufacturing is a very exciting area for me. I uh, just uh, want to mention that uh, the first time we wrote software for a 3D printer was about 15 years ago. And for that, I, I thought it's going to be avalanche of such work coming our way in that time. And it didn't happen. And for, for a while, it was pretty much no work in additive manufacturing until uh, about 2015, 2016 timeframe, I first started 
hearing things at the conferences and first from the major cat vendor CTOs that the stumbling block in uh, progress, progress of additive manufacturing is the software. And uh, coincidentally, right after that, we started getting some requests and work uh, from the industry on adjusting existing software uh, that is applied for uh, CNC machining and uh, as a part of the manufacturing uh, workflow to, to work with AM. And it especially anticipated in the last couple of years, two or three years, that indicates to me that finally uh, AM is going into industrialization areas. It's like prototype is finally started to be used in production. Like with software, right? You write a prototype, it works nice in a test machine, and then you give it to customer and it breaks. So my indirect observations is that uh, Additive manufacturing is maturing, uh, and I attribute it mostly to the advance of uh, material science and uh, introduction of metal-based additive manufacturing. At least, again, I'm not in at the production side. I'm mostly on software development side, but from what I see, metal in additive manufacturing actually brought the whole industry to a different level. And at the same time, from our perspective, open up holes that exist in, this, that existed before in software support for additive manufacturing. Egal, um, uh, to, to you, some of your history and uh, and then what's exciting to you? Yeah, thanks, Jim. I think Igor kind of touched most of the points. I come from the CAD world. I used to run SolidWorks product management and prior to that, PTC product design for all the Korea family. I think the most interesting part that additive or the, chat, the opportunity additive brings is we known for years additive can create shapes that no other manufacturing process can, but that, that's a very small value proposition. I think one of the biggest value propositions now is how do we move from prototyping into production and functional pieces? And that's a whole different set of requirements needed when you put parts in critical mission equipment or you need them or lives are dependent on that. And that software can software can control. Machines are commodity. Sooner or later, machines will become commodity. And that's just like we're used from any mobile device. We buy a mobile device, we have it for two years. But for the next two years, we get software updates that change the behavior of the device and gives us different values. That's exactly what additive will happen as well. But the biggest value proposition is not creating crazy shapes, is having the ability to create material properties and functional behavior that cannot be achieved in any other way. We have over 150 degrees of freedom on the machine. To, so the same powders, the same software, the same machine can create unlimited functional behaviors of the part that no other traditional manufacturing can. And that's that can be only done by software. You cannot manually tweak all those unlimited amount of options. Yeah. Moritz? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Hi, everybody. My name is Moritz. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Elise. I initially started studying aerospace engineering in south of Germany. Then in the last uh, years of my studies, I was kind of bored of these structures, and I had a, a lesson talking about biomethics and I was totally fascinated by these structures and by the complexity basically that nature comes up with solutions and uh, yeah this was my turn into the additive manufacturing world because unfortunately or by good luck at that time this was the only manufacturing technique that was able to somehow mimic these kind of complex structures so I've been uh, working over 10 years in the design for additive manufacturing area as an engineering service team then after my PhD, I went for two years in a technical consulting company, uh, mostly focusing on additive manufacturing. I was supporting CTOs uh, of uh, 3D printer manufacturers, um, binder chatting technology most of the time, and SLM technology. And now at our startup, which is uh, yeah, on the market since roughly three years now, I'm responsible for the product development and also like the um, application engineering. And for me, at least in the last years, um, it's super cool what additive manufacturing has made a huge progress because the machines are getting more and more, now 
mature, I would say. So they're able to produce at a higher speed, more build-up rates are coming up. Also, the technologies are getting better. Super interesting technology raised up in the last three or two years. Um, and so for us as a, yeah, as a company supporting these kind of uh, technology, there's a huge question around which we have to address. And this is how do we get this complexity ego, what you managed? There are so many boundary conditions that we have to keep in mind from the process side, from the design world, from the um, manufacturing world, from the material properties. Everything has to be like streamlined over the whole production chain. And I guess we come to a point that we as humans and with our tools that we are currently able to program or to use, we are not able to, to really control this complexity of freedoms. And so I think we need some yeah, other ways of uh, yeah, getting these challenges done. And that's uh, yeah, what we do with our startup. So let's, let's let's move on to a little bit to challenges and and what are some of the challenges standing in the way of moving industrial from uh, you know from the you know world of prototypes to the you know industrial scale and I, I think some of the challenges um, you know could be on the uh, on the material side and the and the the equipment side um, some of them may be the the software that's actually driving it but then there's also the overall viewpoint of how do you take an idea all the way through to a, a, a produced part that uh, with you know first article quality um, so thinking about that I mean what are some of the challenges that each of you see and and which of those kinds of challenges do you think are sort of the bigger issues uh, I'll, I'll pick on Igor to, to start on that one uh, <clears throat> again uh uh my experience is kind of listening to people who come to us as a, a software development uh, custom software development providers and uh, asking for help or asking us to uh get involved and i see several kind of aspects of it and first of all in general additive manufacturing is a new tool in uh in possession of the people doing <laughs> real work uh, and uh, one of the issues that they face is how do you incorporate this new shiny uh, toy into the kind of existing uh, value production food chain, right? That uh, that already exists without breaking it, just enhancing it. So this is one aspect that uh, kind of need to be addressed. And on the other side is the traditional way of designing, right? Our traditional cap tools are all boundary boundary presentations. Uh, while the additive manufacturing by defined is volume based um, kind of uh, process. So on these both sides, we have to be disconnecting everything in between. So the multiple gaps, which one is most uh, glaring, it's hard for me to say, because we are seeing people coming with different and uh, for me to uh, assess that design is a bottleneck or incorporating the AM into the uh, workflow of uh, big manufacturing enterprises is a bigger issue. It's hard for me to know. Uh, data inter interoperability is always there lurking under, underneath, right? Uh, and we see all of these uh, projects kind of uh, going through us. So I think there's a quite a few gaps in this, uh, this process. Which one is most critical? It's probably Gal has better view on that right now, being in on the manufacturing side, switching sites, and going from design to real production. All right, so we'll we'll turn it to Igal then. Yeah, I'll I'll take it from here. Thanks, Igor. On, on my first, I've been in GE for two years now. On my first day, they showed me a video of a melt pool simulation. So when the laser hits the the the, the powder, it creates a melt pool of one second took 12 hours to simulate which means we cannot react in real time and if sometimes the print can take a month depending on the size of the of the print we're talking about we today on every laser print we collect one terabyte of data so think about the the, the major three steps during a printing process which is the bill preparation then the printing itself and what happens in the post-processing and the times are huge sometimes if you make a mistake and the print of weeks went down the tubes you have to do it all over again we are simulation has been 
very much used in the design world for decades. Cre we are being driven by geometry, which is where the AI market is mostly is today, has to change. It has to be driven by simulation and compensation. That's where we invest most of our efforts on trying to digitally predict what needs to be sent to the machine. I think one of the most famous examples of additive parts is the GE nozzle, which goes into the fuel jet engines. It took about seven years to develop it before it went to production. Companies like GE has the resources to do that. To make it into industrialization, most companies will not invest in that. And so that's where software comes in. How do we shrink the development time? There is all the whole notion about cost of production comparing to traditional manufacturing, absolutely. But how do we shrink the development time to a reasonable time frame without people developing the skills that big companies may have the resources to do? That's what we're working on. We want to put in, in the, our software, it puts in the hand of a normal engineer, I would say, the ability to produce parts in a reasonable time frame. Ruth, anything to add there? Oh, I totally agree with, with Eagle. It's absolutely the same thing that we experience in our projects. Usually we have the design department who is coming up with the geometry, which just looks shine and fancy. But then like the, the workload and the testing and the, the setup of the build shops afterwards and the laser powers and the, and the hatching strategy and everything that has been like to do until this, pro, uh, this shop can be built in a serious quality. This is so much work. And at the end, at, th at this stage, basically in the last phase, until the, the, the process quality is good enough, um, there's basically no design change anywhere possible because it would take all over again to redo the simulation, for example. So there's like an, a gap between what we think we should print and at the end what we print. And as long as we do not like you know, mention or come up with a solution how to connect these worlds, that we are really able to not only take the geometry into account, but also the process and, and the quality and, and do the, the loops between those those two worlds, basically. When when I could wish myself something which could be like the ideal situ uh, situation as some kind of, I don't know, artificial intelligence sitting on the end of the real job and predicting what comes out of the job and gives this to my very beginning, to my development engineer at the CAD tool maybe, to give him an advice if this, what he thinks is the optimal geometry, is really coming out later on the printer, or if we maybe should think about a completely other, other geometry at the very beginning. So this would be really cool. Yeah, to add to Moritz's point, I think one of the biggest challenges to convert additive into industrialization is not looking at it as point solutions. There are unbelievable great point solutions in the market today that solve pro small problems. Absolutely. This need, that you, need to, you need a system look at it. You need a closed loop system that understands that that's, why, that's what the one terabyte of data we, is used for. We feed it back into the build preparation. So every time you print more, the next time you learn. Again, the, the goal is to shrink the development time. And development time you can only shrink when you're able to un understand and analyze the data. That's pretty talking about software, the software side. Um, I, I get, I think, you know, we've talked about simulation. Um, you know, if you think that the areas that uh, software has helped in, in all sorts of engineering and, uh, and manufacturing over the years has been about um, the data side, making sure that we've got interoperable data, uh, making sure that we're managing it well, making sure we've got workflows and that we're automating processes. Uh, where we can, and then also, um, you know, making sure that we're uh, pulling in the right pieces, but doing it in a cohesive way, uh, sort of in an integrated way. Um, you know, where do you think uh, where do you think software applications are the most important, and uh, what what elements of um, what e elements of industrialization are going to be impacted? The most by software and I, I know we've already talked about simulation um you know any anything else sort of on that broader on the broader view um Egal, i know you started talking about uh you know not point solutions so maybe we'll start with you again i see so many familiar names in the attendee list people i worked with before and i come from the design world the tools that are needed today to design for additive don't exist yet 
the CAD tools today are not designed for editing. The amount of data that needs, because editing is all ex about explicit geometry. And the representations we have in the CAD tools today, and most of the CAD kernels today are working very hard to add implicit representations as well. But what, that's, that's, a, that's a glass ceiling today of the complexity and the size of data that the design engineers can produce. And on our side, again, we're not a design company, we are, we are an additive company, but it introduces many, many challenges of how to deal with data first, before we even get it ready for simulation and, and build preparation. Um, but yeah, absolutely. So I think we're all suffering from, someone made a decision 30 years ago to use STL. <laughs> That's, that is still a very big pain point. And we are pushing very hard. Again, we're only focusing on GE machines, right? We have three different modalities in the GE portfolio. We're focusing on GE machines and we're encouraging customers very much not to use mesh data. We, we, we'll, we'll deal with the data in the way we need, it depends on the, on the task. But why, why carry a one gig of mesh? And that's the size of data we're dealing with when you have heat exchangers. There is not much you can do with it. And you, and you don't need the one gig of mesh for every different tasks in the process. You need different types of representations. And the, the, so we, before we even get into editing, we're investing a lot into creating the right data that we need based on the tasks that the users are going through for optimization purposes. Or as you already gave us your, uh, your, dream, your dream solution, but uh, overall, where do you see the, the impact of software on uh, industrialization? Closed loop. It has to be. Oh, you're asking me or Moritz? Sorry. Moritz, please. <laughs> oh, oh, I apologize. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So I think like the, the the artificial intelligence might be in the future. But usually, um, what 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 I think now at also at our projects is that we are we are coming to a very complex problem here. And I totally agree. Like having STLs or geometry or these silo solutions, this cannot be the solutions because we cannot tackle the complexity. Um, but I guess uh, engineers have solved this kind of complexity world already in other technologies. If I'm looking, for example, at technologies like model-based systems engineering, where you're not talking about the final design or about, let's say, the material selections and everything, we are talking about problem stating, about functions that have to be fulfilled, and about rules how to come up with solutions for these problems. And I guess with this system approach, looking at the end-to-end -end process and defining let's say, rules and boundary conditions, what is possible, what is not possible, what is what kind of freedom do I have in my design, what kind of um, laser power do I have in my in my, my uh, um, system, what kind of hatching strategy is possible, should I use the same hatching strategy over and over again, or should I switch it? So I can define lots of rules, how basically the whole system could be produced, and then I guess uh, it's not humans to find the optimal solution, it's only like algorithms who can do this. So I pretty much like the idea of only like as an engineer giving the problem statement and then letting some nice uh, intelligent algorithm solve the job because uh, the thing is getting too complex for us. Igor, what do you think? It sounds like uh, we need a bit of automation uh, and some. And yeah, some I, I see a lot of work for us <laughs> coming <laughs> down the pipe. Uh, but uh, yeah, and uh, but I still think that uh, it's going to be evolutionary. Uh, development for a while until the big revolution will come and uh, I see people from different sites from software sites and from manufacturing sites trying to adjust uh, what's what exists on the market so people trying to create specialized plugins for the existing systems or building on the top of existing components um, and um, I mean we all know that uh, there are market is slightly fractured so it's also kind of creates additional boundaries for for creating this comprehensive solution that the goal uh, refers to but I hopeful that in the future that it will come but until it comes I think uh, I see quite a few steps before that let's put it this way so, Terry, we mentioned you know CAD tools and, and geometry and uh, Merce you mentioned early on sort of the the way that uh, you know additive um, you know can can you know 
bring in shapes that are more, uh, you know, more organic, for example, um, you know, more, more uh, caused by nature. Um, generative design has uh, obviously been a very interesting development. Um, you know, again, not one of the brand new, you know, I think even some of the comments I see, there's not a, not a lot of brand new technology always, but it's the application of it, you know, and, and making it uh, work. Um, what is generative design adding to the industrialization of additive and what needs to happen with that? Um, Morris, maybe we'll start with you this time. Yeah, thanks for the question. Very interesting. Maybe to start first, uh, for me, generative design usually is some kind of a buzzword. So everybody's talking about it, but nobody really knows what is behind it. This technology, it, it sounds fancy and it will solve the problems, but some of the people maybe just understand topology optimization out of it. Other understand design of experiments, so coming up with multiple variants out of it. So it, it, it's really diverse what is behind generative design. Uh, for me, as uh, what I think where this generative design is adding value to a huge complex problem like additive manufacturing is when we have this possibility to explore the design space, to come up with multiple possible solutions that are generated by algorithms. Kind of doesn't matter what kind of algorithm is behind the system, but it gives us engineers the, the possibility to analyze sensitivities, to identify parameters or sweet spots where I should place my design or where I should not place my design or which machine should I use or which, uh, I don't know, hatching or which uh, support structure I should use. So it, it opens up a universe of possibilities. And of course, this directly uh, drives into the, the quick the big question, if you have a complex problem with multiple of parameters, I guess Igal was mentioning like 150 and overall terabytes of data that come out of this thing. So it's a complex thing. And I guess generative design could be one um, yeah, idea or one solution to, to get an overview over all the possibilities. Igor, any, uh, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, again, it's a very exciting development. Uh, generative design and uh, demos very well. Uh, on our uh, practical approach, what we see is that uh, it's still kind of standalone thing, right? Uh, I, I know that uh, some big companies are buying startups and trying to incorporate this generative design into existing CAD tools, which may help on a traditional manufacturing, but I'm not sure if Combining generative design with the existing tools will help much in the additive, but it, it still has to be a part of the overall workflow, right? And as Egal mentioned, uh, design is just a part of it. And if uh, generative design will be uh, partnered, so to speak, with uh, material properties and simulation and uh, then feedback loop of, okay, we simulated, we got it, what's the difference, how we do, uh, design better next time, right? Uh, that's the again uh, shiny uh, <clears throat> city on the hill that we are marching toward. Uh, but it, it's still a great step forward and it's uh, opening up uh, opportunities that didn't exist before in design versus AM opening up uh, opportunities that didn't exist before in manufacturing. So it's kind of emerging technologies that should support each other. As a matter of fact, people who are designing traditional tools, they don't need probably a generative design as much. I mean, traditional part, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Egal, what is your thought on uh, on generative design and the impact on uh, additive manufacturing? I'll just say two magic words, which is multi-physics simulation. The moment we can do multi-physics simulation, we can get the real value from additive because then it will not be driven by shape it will be driven by the functional behavior of the produced part and as long as it's not there yet then it's still as Igor said it's nice demo it's it has applications there's no question it has applications but I think the biggest value will be when when we have multi-physics simulation so, so what other technologies um you know we've got a lot of a lot of exciting uh you know artificial intelligence uh you know coming to the forefront now we've got a lot of things happening with uh with the cloud um you know becoming much more popular maybe maybe being industrialized as well um you know analytics has grown um what do you think are some of the key technologies that are coming to the forefront 
and how can they help push industrialization of additive manufacturing forward? Who wants to get us started? Um, I, uh, the goal, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, 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 again, it's observational uh, what we see people trying, and I kind of, from the general perspective, uh, think that it's a, a direction. I think cloud is one of the enabling uh, factors, and the couple of aspects of cloud is basically availability of quote unquote unlimited computing resources, as what the Gulf um, mentioned uh, with respect to simulation, right? Uh, in order for small shops, uh, smaller companies, not GEs of this world, to move to additives, they have to have the ability to simulate and not to create a kind of high performance computing centers on their premises. So cloud as the availability of resources for simulation is great enabler. But I also would like to mention cloud as a kind of communication and accessibility device. Uh, like for example, I wrote, I, I read in news that BMW creates a center of excellence for 3D uh, printing and basically collecting all machines in one place to generate knowledge and kind of uh, bring these 3D printing into the industrial age. If you pre uh, collect machines in one place, then how do you disseminate knowledge or how do you make uh, those machines available across the multiple geographic zones and time zones and distances? And cloud is a great enabler because it would allow people to basically send their data uh, and uh, kind of combine locality of the center and the experience kind of accumulation with the availability of these services worldwide, so to speak. So I think uh, cloud is one of the enablers. Again, it, <laughs> it needs the software to, it's an underlying infrastructure. It needs the software to become useful. Good, Egon Moritz, any, anybody want to add to either the applicability of the cloud or value of the cloud or uh, another pick another technology that's going to help us industrialize additive? Sure, I think we're used to, in the in the design phase, PLM has been very well adopted in most companies today, some kind of PLM or PDM solutions. None of that exists for additive today. But additive is a development process as well. People need to collaborate even on a build preparation and people need to do revisions and versioning and sharing. So the cloud is a great enabler to go beyond just what people are used to for the design phase. Because And PLM is not meant to do that. PLM doesn't understand the, the additive process. It, it, it can manage the files are coming out of it. But that's also the issue. Who wants to manage files anymore? Look at all the cloud solutions that come from for the design world. So and that's exactly what we're, we're utilizing the cloud to put our solution on it to en enable companies or external people to be all collaborating together. I oh, totally, totally agree. Maybe one, one thing to add from our perspective, it's definitely the how basically that we can we tackle this huge amount of data that we analyze during the build shops and also during the, the, the quality process and also maybe afterwards having some kind of digital twins during the life uh, procedure of the, of the part itself to learn how it is basically pro, um, taking care uh, of the quality later in its life cycle. And I guess uh, to be able to analyze and to tackle this huge amount of data, cloud and maybe later some learning systems on it will definitely help us to get this thing done. Yeah, the, we, we, to continue on more, it's the huge amounts of data that are needed for 3D for build preparation. The desktop computers, the Windows architectures are not designed for that. Mm. They, they reach the limit. With the cloud, we have the ability to, to deal with that amount of data without hanging your computer and waiting for, for days for it to finish a simulation job. Hmm. Unfortunately, at least here in our uh, customer base in Europe, uh, people are a little bit afraid still uh, of the cloud. So I guess, uh, Egal, at your uh, place, people are more open-minded to that. So I would really appreciate people or even engineers and big companies being more open-minded to this new technology because it will definitely help us uh, uh, getting success in this new manufacturing technique? Well, coming from GE, when we work with DOD and the government, it's very rigid uh, security and 
It's Absolutely. not about being afraid. It's about showing that the data is saved, the IP is protected. And yeah, there is a psychological issue as well, but there are, there are bigger players right now dealing with psychological issues on using the cloud. We are, yeah. we are riding that wave. Yeah, no, we've certainly seen in our research, we've seen that the transition to the cloud being something that is is gaining speed and, and picking up both for both for the collaborative nature of being able to share data, uh, but also for uh, sort of the infinite uh, high performance computing that uh, that you talked about being able to access um, just the, the iron that uh, is available in the cloud to uh, to to run uh, to run processes. Um, I love this question. Um, you know, we would all just love to have a print button sitting on the uh, the end of our the sitting sitting on our desk, and uh, you know, pull something together, hit hit print, and the machines uh, spin up, right? Um, what's what's standing in the way of the print button, or is that uh, is that just not realistic in the first place? Um, Marissa, you you, uh, you seem to like the print button idea. So, uh, what, what's your thought? Do you have one? I guess uh, not in the near future. It's just too complex. So, I've been in contact with um, a printing manufacturer who are doing this on maybe on the FDM technology. So, on like like the, the tools and jigs and tools where there's no uh, you know, like security um, issues behind it. But but if I'm talking about like a like Eagle on his parts, I guess there will never be something like a print button. <laughs> You go. We're working towards that. I agree with what it's about the challenges. I think users of additive today don't trust the process. They don't trust the softwares. They don't trust the automatic orientation, automatic support. They don't trust the printers yet. But that's exactly what we're working on, on making a predictable and repeatable process. And because they don't trust it yet, they're asking for so many capabilities and degrees of freedom in the tools so they can keep tweaking it manually. But, and that's that's where the closed loop comes in again. Yeah. The better the systems become, the more predictable the results become. In the end of the day, they want a final part. They don't care if, 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 if the part comes out the way they want, let the process be whatever there is. But I, th I see one of the questions on, on about how long it will take. Our goal in G, we put a target for ourselves to industrialize additive by the end of this century. Additive has been around for 30 years, but if it's not getting industrialized in the next several years, it may go away, guys, because companies that in the end have to pay the bill say, why am I investing so long until I get the part I want? So decade I, probably ago, not the century. What did I say? The decade, yeah, yeah, the decade. I would not be alive. <laughs> yeah, not by the, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to be around to see it, so Me that would too. be good. Well, maybe we can 3D print pieces by then, body parts by then. But... <laughs> by the day. You're yeah. working on the print button. I, I know that uh, you've got a lot of uh, things in development. Is, if I look behind you, am I going to see the prototype back there? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, at executive level, people often ask about it, but we are trying to kind of put a damper on these uh, expectations and say, uh, it's not there yet. I mean, just look at the new types of processes that have been incorporated in 3 printing. It's every several months, you may read the article about new process that has been incorporated into the 3D printing world. So until this all <laughs> sorted out, print button is a is even farther away. Uh, let's let us kind of print. Uh, predictably on this particular type of printer, right? And uh, tell designer, okay, uh, what you design is not gonna be printed. Please change this, this, and this. And then, as the gal said, maybe produce a simulating part, or well, based on your design, here's what you may expect, and here's a variations you may expect, and here's a predictable, I mean, percentage of output that you would get out of this out of this design, I mean, every second part will be defective, or every, maybe one out of 10 will be right, something like that. Yeah. But print button, it's great, but. Yeah. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, a, a you know, an area where the print button has been a little bit more realistic in, in sort of, uh, you know, traditional CAM. Um, you know, we've seen, you know, obviously machining has changed, uh, you know, 
with uh, you know five axis and things like that. Uh, but we've seen some some standardization, some commonization of uh, what's happening in CAM software. And uh, you know, again, it's it's a different problem set. But um, you know, do you see do you see at some point a level of uh, sort of universality or commonization in uh, 3D printing software to the same level that we maybe do in uh, in more traditional CAM, or do you see it being a, a, a much more custom thing um, to specific applications over time? Um, Egal, I'm going to start you on this one. I don't know. Look at this. Look at the CAD world. It's been around for over 30 years. Still proprietary data formats, right? With with some standard formats which we know don't don't transfer IP. There will have to be some some standardization. There are some basic communication OPCU between machines and some uh, CLI files for slice results. But still, because each machine is like a science fiction by itself of what's on the process itself, it's so proprietary that I don't know if it will ever be shared with uh, with the people that create the geometries. And uh, it's, a ch it's a challenge, no question. Words? Uh, that's a tough one. I, I To be honest, I don't believe it. So I think there will be always some kind of like proprietary um, things happening because this uh, system is it's so complex and we have so much different technologies from the hardware side, from the software side. So everything is so like diverse. So it would really be something that I, you know, that I don't doubt. It's It will be always like even worth like in the cat world, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, well, and you had the material uh, material variability in there too, right? E Igor, yeah. thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's so many more degrees of freedom or <laughs> unpredictability, so to speak, uh, than in traditional subtractive, right? And in volume and any material property on a granular site creates so much uh, variant, so so many variants into the process that it's probably hard to see how it could be standardized in the future. I mean, the, the difference of processes between pl plastic-based, uh, several plastic-based uh, printing and different metals, it's so much different that, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't see ask it us, happening. Ask either. us in 10 years, Jim. Huh? Ask us in 10 years. Let's do it again in 10 years. All right, we'll, uh, we'll set, set the clock. We'll have, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have a little reunion uh, webcast. It'll probably be a virtual reality or augmented reality webcast by then. I'm sure we'll have some uh, some different uh, some different collaboration technologies. Um, listen, I, I want to thank all of you for uh, for your participation and, and making this both educational and fun today. Um, it was a great conversation. I really enjoyed it a lot, and uh, I hope the participants did as well. Um, we had some good questions come in. We weren't able to get to all of them, so uh, we'll follow up with those individually. Um, but uh, just thank you again for for joining uh, for joining us and on behalf of AMC Bridge. Um, definitely want to thank uh, all of the panelists. Really appreciate the content and uh, your expertise. Thank you. Our ple my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank here. you, everyone. Thank bye you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.